Welcome to the AgriHive Business Summit Series, presented in partnership with Centacare CQ as part of the Australian Government Drought Assistance Package. We hope Roger will give some real insights into the climatic variation in Australia. The value is in planning around the information from this series. Share this video and like us on Facebook. And don't forget to enter the Kidworth competition on www.agrihive.com. All are welcome. Let us know what you think. Well, market insight is of no help to anyone if you don't have feed or even stock. Those future high prices or changes sound promising, but how long will you need to hold on before your country recovers from the current drought? Our next speaker wants you to be able to use climate models yourself to better enable yourself to do your own forecasting and, of course, make better informed decisions. If you've ever looked into the sky in hope for rain, then you've probably heard of Professor Roger Stone from the University of Southern Queensland. He has more than 37 years of experience in meteorological and climatical research with a focus on modelling and its application to Australian and global agricultural production. Professor Stone is the Program Chair of the UN World Meteorological Organisation Commission for Agriculture and Meteorolo Meteorology. I knew I wasn't going to get through all of this without one slip up. But more importantly, he is our next guest speaker, so please welcome him to the stage. I have too many slides as always, so this talk normally takes three hours, so you're lucky to get the 15 minute version, provided that Nicole can keep me on time. <clears throat> so I just press the enter button and away we go, yeah? So thanks to Meat and Livestock Australia, who's uh, funded a lot of this work over the years. I don't have 36 slides there, just in case I get a few questions. So acknowledgements to the University of Southern Queensland and the Technical Commission for Agricultural Meteorology. This is in uh, a technical commission, not a political commission. So a few um, take-home points uh, to put this in some sort of context. Australia has the world's highest level of rainfall variability. Everyone knew that? Highest in the world more than any other country on earth. After us comes South Africa, Germany, France, New Zealand, India, UK, Canada, China, and so on, way down the list. We have the highest in the world. Remarkable. Everyone knew that? Yeah. And in Australia, the way you read this, uh, any area shaded white has less variability than you would expect given the annual average rainfall and, uh, and latitude. Any area not shaded white has higher rainfall, higher variability rather, higher variability than you would expect given their latitude and annual average rainfall. So those areas shaded orange and red have the highest rainfall variability in Australia and Australia has the highest variability in the world. That's the first thing to put up with, which is fascinating, isn't it? Absolutely incredible. And we, we're pretty close to one of those red dots, I would say. Quite a remarkable feature. So that's the first part of the patterns we have to contend with. Almost counterintuitively, the higher the variability, the easier it is to forecast on a seasonal basis. And it all comes back to this. These patterns in the global ocean, particularly the, um, the Central Pacific Ocean, uh, around here along the, uh, along the equator. This is back in October of 1988. I don't know what your season was like in 88, 89, but my guess it, it would be pretty good. Notice there you've got warmer than normal sea temperatures around the uh, Coral Sea and around northern Australia and cooler than normal water out there in the central and eastern Pacific. That's the sort of pattern we need for the really good seasons. 2010 was exactly like that. 1974, for anyone that can remember back that far. 1956 was like that. Okay. Just like that in the oceans. And this is for free. This is one of our own uh, outputs, but you can pick this up off uh, various websites. The US government's Climate Prediction Centre is probably the best and so on. This is how it looked in 1991 before the 91 to 94 drought really got going. See the difference there in the central and eastern Pacific? I'm going to go very quickly now, okay? I've got lots of slides and wiggly lines and, and maps and things like that. This is how it looked just a month or so back. What does that look like to you? What would you call that? Bit neutral. It's probably, I would call a borderline El Nino. So there are shades of grey 
in this business. So often we have a pattern that almost gets there, but is often enough to cause us damage. Okay? That's, and that's actually what we're facing for the time being, a borderline pattern, which I suppose if you're looking at on the bright side of life, you can say, well, occasionally allow some rain to come in, but it's still lurking out there. And it's lurking out there in the, underneath the surface of the ocean as well. This links to this little diagram here to the circulation patterns Above the surface of the ocean, uh, where you've, everyone's here probably heard of the Southern Oscillation and the Southern Oscillation Index, and especially the Walker Circulation, which is not named after um, uh, James Walker, I discovered. It's named after Sir Gilbert Walker, who um, discovered this back in 1923, which we then forgot about for, for 60 years, but never mind. So some good work done to link all these act this activity in the, um, on the global oceans with circulation patterns just above the surface of the ocean. However, there are a number of patterns out there to deal with. The ones that get most of the airplay, uh, if you can see that down below the couch, but uh, there's the El Nino Southern Oscillation, the second, the second one down. Okay? That's, that's probably the main driver of our year-to-year -year variability. Everyone's heard of El Nino. They all have Spanish words, El Nino and La Nino, for interesting reasons. It tends to last about one year. What I often show, if um, with the grain industry and so on, we have some management decisions, if you can imagine on the left-hand side of this diagram, what would link to year-to-year -year management decisions? Destocking, uh, stocking, uh, adjustment, perhaps. There's the Madden Julian oscillation. Anyone heard of that? The MJO, which comes through about every 30 to 50 days. It came through last week through the tropical um, areas to the north of Australia. It kicks up an upper trough as it comes past um, this part of the world. So that would return again in about five weeks. Okay, four or five weeks. Be interesting. So that helps you. But the timing of rainfall, they, it most often, not always, depends on the type of year. But in these types of years, it's probably the main period you're going to pick up your rainfall. There's another one called the quasi-biennial oscillation. It's my favourite. It doesn't get much airplay. For some reason, ABC don't like to cover it. I don't know why. They even edit it out if I speak about it. It's, um, it's, a, it's, a, lovely, it's a lovely beast. It's been a, it normally has a two-year return period. It's the main reason for the drought conditions we've had in Northern Territory and... Um, around this part of the world for the last few years. In the last month, it's moved into a slightly more favourable pattern. That's good, yeah? It's good. It links with other systems out there. There's the Antarctic Circumpolar Wave, the uh, Southern Annular Mode, the latitude of the subtropical ridge, which is where the high-pressure cells move further north or south every 10 years. Decadal, interdecadal patterns, 50-year patterns, and a bit of climate change as well, if you, if you like looking at that. All mixed up together. There's even a couple I haven't mentioned there, which makes life interesting. So they, they all have their role, they all have the different time periods. These are the key ones, the MJO, the El Nino Southern Oscillation, or ENSO, and the latitude of the subtropical ridge. Forty years ago, Barry Pittock and CSIRO produced this little diagram on the left-hand side, and it still works. He said, this, if you're looking for impacts of El Nino when you've got an El Nino developing in the Pacific Ocean, or a La Nina on the other side, on a year-to-year -year basis, that hatched area there is the main part of Australia that has, it feels its impacts. That's in Australia. Notice that line is roughly, if you have a look at the map up around this part of the world, is roughly halfway between um, Winton and Bullia. So west of that line has far less impact from El Nino and La Nina, one way or another. A bit in winter, but it doesn't matter so much perhaps in winter, which is not their main production period um, in terms of grasses and so on. But this is, and he did this on an annual January to December basis, but as we know, the best way to pick, pick your way through this is to... Um, is to look at your rainfall records from July to June, something like that. The other one you notice, the second most important pattern is the latitude of the high pressure belt. Every 10 or 11 years that comes a lot further north and, and cuts out your rainfall quite considerably, especially if the QBO is in a westerly phase, which it has been for the last two years. This is what the QBO looks like and the impacts it has on our rainfall, September, November, one of the reasons why it's been dry in the southeast and recently drought declared. I'm going to move quickly, um, Nicole. Okay? You can ask me about the QBO afterwards. You start putting all this together, along with upper-level winds in the Pacific Ocean. These are westerlies. You can look at this uh, off the Climate Prediction Centre from the US. Westerlies are the bad guys uh, along the equator. You can see that, that burst there, uh, which is associated partly with tropical cyclone around... Um, Hawaii, which is very rare, unless you have an El Nino developing. Unless you have an El Nino developing, you don't get those westerly bursts out of cyclones in Hawaii. So that's not a particularly good sign. If we put some of this together, you get a model output. This is a climate, an ocean model, forecasting what's going to happen in the central Pacific, that important part of the Pacific we talked about very early on. Okay? 
This is out of the best climate prediction centre in the world in terms of ocean atmosphere modelling, which is in Washington DC, as it turns out. And it's predicting what? It's predicting warmer than normal sea temperatures out there in the central and eastern Pacific right through until autumn or beyond 2015, which is an El Nino event. Okay, So it's not me making it up. So this, is, this came out of the US Climate Prediction Centre last week. At this time, the consensus of forecasts suggests El Nino to emerge more outside of its borderline state during the August-October period and to peak during the late northern hemisphere fall and early winter, which is our spring and summer. Okay? So it's not me making this up. This is out the US Climate Prediction Centre. And that's the forecast of what the sea temperatures are going to do in the central and eastern Pacific. Now this gets updated almost every day. So if you want to get it on that website, you can copy down very quickly at the top. What's that CPC? You can track this every day as easy as I can. Okay, so this is the idea of tracking this on a day or week to week basis. But at the moment that's not a particularly uh, bright pattern in terms of El Nino events. That's what it's showing at the moment. Um, and in fact some information overnight suggests it may drift into next year a bit more than normal. Okay, that's what you keep track on. Um, we've seen this 24 uh, month rainfall before from Ben, thank you for that, and pasture growth patterns. Um, this is the forecast now. There are two types of forecasts. Statistical forecasts based on patterns of the Southern Oscillation Index, patterns, right? The change in values over time, the rate of change and so on. Put all that together, and it's assuming the current situation continues for the next week or so, so we can update this in a week on ABC or whatever, or you could look at this yourself. That's what it looks like for the September-November period. September-November. The areas in blue have high rainfall probability values. The areas in yellow and orange have very low rainfall probability values, okay? This is for that September-November period, just September-November, which is not really long enough, is it? So to go forward, you, know, you use a, a more sophisticated modelling system, so this is why we're good friends with the UK government. So thanks to the Honourable um, Margaret Thatcher, we... Um, I'll, we use these sorts of models with an agreement we have in the UK. These are general circulation models, and they produce something like this. This is out of the European Centre in Reading in the UK. So these are more sophisticated models that look at the, all the physics of the ocean and the atmosphere. How am I going for time? That's all. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and put it together going forward, okay? ECMWF, so you could Google this and, or whatever. And there's the website at the top. So actually that looks more realistic on there than my, my picture. For October, November, all those yellowy areas show about a 20% chance of getting the long-term median rainfall rel relevant or respective to that time of the year. Right, it's all relevant to that period. What's the long-term median October, November for every little rain gauge in the country? So it's all relative to the time of year. So fairly low probability values for that October, November period. It's not zero, which is a point that might be worth taking up later. It's not a 0% chance or 100% chance as it showed up in 2010. 2010, 100% chance of above normal rainfall and seven times the normal chance of getting excessive rainfall. This is, so sometimes it's 0, 100, this time it's 20, 80, something like that. So that might be a factor to, to consider. Okay, so that's the region here we're concentrating on to some extent. If we go forward another month, I'll go quickly, November, January, see how it's sort of concentrating more in the eastern part of the country, at least at the current model outputs, and that's partly that reason I gave before. We now have a slightly better pattern coming out of the system because of our friend, our new friend, the QBO, which helps the conditions a little bit further west. A bit safer country in the current pattern that seems to be evolving, in my opinion. In my opinion. Eastern Australia is showing that classic pattern as Barry Pittock showed in 1975, as where we probably have the drier conditions. Same applying to Southeast Asia, by the way. And Parts, other parts of the world. And this is December, February, it's much the same, much the same story, okay? Eastern part of the country, slightly higher probabilities actually, 30% instead of 20% um, in, in Eastern Australia. So this is out of the European Centre, which happens to produce the best climate models for a longer term, this is getting into 2015 now, than we can do ourselves, um, such as the um, good investment they made in the UK many years ago. Um, I'm closing up now. Um, with your permission, uh, just one final point I'd make, or the last second last point. Um, assuming this El Nino continues to develop, like the US government center is showing, this is the typical impact, forecast impact actually, some work we did many years ago, globally. 
And it's sort of interesting, isn't it? There's, uh, Australia, as you can see, has low rainfall probabilities. So does South Africa. So does Northeast Brazil and Central America, where they grow a massive amount of coffee, just by the way. So does Western Africa and the Sahel, where there's about 100 million people on this point, point of starvation. But the, others, the other half of the world gets excessive rain. The world is usually out of balance, which is fascinating. Fascinating for trading, commodity trading, price, all sorts of things. Uh, so much of China gets excessive rain, while we have uh, very much less rain. Eastern Africa tends to get flood rain, gets them out of drought, Ethiopia and um, Kenya, those areas. Argentina tends to get uh, much more rain, so they get high rainfall probabilities. The US gets high rainfall probabilities. Parts of Europe and Eastern, uh, um, Eastern Europe and into Central Asia tend to have good years as, as well. Uh, this is going further into the year, but notice China and, and so on there getting high rainfall while we're getting fairly low rainfall. It's interesting. The world's usually out of balance and uh, um, it's, that has interest, I think, for things like price and exports and demand and all sorts of things. That's my second last slide and we're doing some work thanks to uh, Tom Davidson and MLA with looking at the whole uh, supply chain of this sort of issue as well as looking at all the good work in, in producer production areas in um, drought preparation and, and adjustment and so on, but also the transport processing issues, a whole lot of decisions make there that this sort of climate information, if targeted appropriately, could have high value, we think, through to market signals and, and global trade and so on and so forth. Interesting work that we can, um, we can develop with your um, interest. So, summary. Recent marginal improvement of the overall pattern due to a shift to this more favourable phase of the QBO, right, a new friend, the quasi-biennial oscillation. So the main benefit would be further west from here into Northern Territory and so on. So it usually, it's, it's been the reason for a lot of the dry weather we've had in that part of the world for the last few years before this El Nino pattern started to develop. The borderline El Nino in place, that gives a slight bit of hope. If it weakens off a bit, allow a bit of rain to come in. Um, it, so it's not all bad news for the time being, I guess you'd say, particularly east, I said on the radio, east of the railway line, east of the highway, roughly east of the highway. Right? So this main area El Nino has impact, places like Emerald and Alpha and places like that. Most of these ocean atmosphere models, especially the US government model, which I, would, which I hang my reputation on, the Climate Prediction Centre in Maryland, show some s intensification of this El Nino through our southern hemisphere spring then into summer, main, am main impact on eastern Queensland, eastern Australia. No clear sign of a breakdown in this slowly evolving sort of pattern in the Pacific Ocean in the Southern Hemisphere autumn when they mostly break, so still look to see if it will break in autumn of 2015. There's no clear sign of that happening at this stage. Always update this on a monthly basis or a weekly basis um, and there's a need to link to management decisions across this whole supply value chain. And that's my email address and always have uh, pay homage to the Central Pacific Ocean. Thank you very much. Share this video and like us on Facebook. And don't forget to enter the Kidworth competition on www.agrihive.com. All are welcome.